Hey, this morning I'm going to share with you, just continuing on, just some things we need to, to grow in, some areas in our life we need some strength in. Uh, and so perhaps today, as in the past few weeks when we taught about rejection and bitterness, last week we, we taught <clears throat> on offense. One of the things I said to you last week was, <clears throat> be sure that, you know, if you have been offended, that you release them. And as I told you before, <clears throat> people came to me and said, Pastor, I release you. And uh, so I've been just giving blanket releases to everybody. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about endurance, endurance. And we're going to be specific about endurance. We're going to talk about enduring, challenging people. Oh, how many of you have some challenging people in your life? We're going to talk about what it means to endure challenging people. The word endurance, actually, the Bible, best Bible definition of endurance is to bear up courageously, to bear up courageously. So we're going to talk about enduring people, challenging people, and then uh, we'll conclude with talking about enduring trials and tribulations. Anybody had any of those? All right, let's get right into it. Enduring, challenging people. Second Timothy chapter two, beginning at verse one, Paul is speaking to Timothy. Paul is mature. Uh, he's had some experience in ministry. Timothy is young. He's a new pastor. He's wet behind the ears. So Paul's giving him some help and instruction. And he says, so, my son, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is to be found in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me, the things I've been teaching you, among many witnesses, commit the things I've taught you to faithful people, to other faithful people, to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, don't do all the work yourself. Let other people be involved as well. And then it says this, <clears throat> therefore, you must learn to endure hardship. <clears throat> Some translations say endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Enduring hardness, and you'll see the context of the entirety of this chapter is really talking about enduring hardness challenging people, enduring what we would call problem people. Do you have any of those challenging people in your life? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to point at anyone. But we do have challenging people in our lives. Let's go to verse 10 in this chapter. Therefore, I endure all things. Paul is saying, I have learned how to endure, to bear up courageously under the challenge of people that are difficult. I have learned to endure all things, and I do it, I have learned this for the sake of the elect, or I, I have learned these things for the sake of the church, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul is saying, learning how to endure challenging people is so important that people's salvation is at stake. Now, that's serious business. He says, I've learned to endure all things for the sake of the church, of the elect. When a believer in the body doesn't handle conflict with other people, in or out of the body, well, it will affect the body of Christ. It will affect the church negatively. Let's go to verse 11. So do you want to learn to live and walk with Jesus? This is a faithful saying. If we die with him, if we die to ourselves, we'll also live with him. We'll live in and through him. Verse 12, if we endure, we'll reign with him. You want to learn how to reign in life? Endure. Learn how to endure. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. He won't deny himself. 
You want to learn to be a man or woman of faith, a mountain-moving person of faith? Well, you need to learn some things about what it means to endure. Now, here is the recipe for that kind of life, the kind of life that lives and walks with Jesus, the kind of life that reigns with Jesus, the kind of life that has mountain-moving faith at work in your life. Here's the recipe for that kind of life, verse 14. Remind them of these things. Charge them, encourage them before the Lord, talking about the church, the elect, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Verse 14 says, don't strive or don't battle each other with words. It doesn't profit anyone. Now, strife in a church body is the result of battling words. Notice what this verse says. Word strife ruins those who hear it. Not only does it keep people from salvation, but those who are saved get ruined by word battles, word strife. You may think that your strife, your your word battles with someone else affects only the one directly involved, but people are caught in the firing line. They really are. The military calls it friendly fire. Let's go to verse 15. Then this. this. This is a scripture verse that we've all quoted, but I want you to hear this in context of the entirety of the chapter, which is dealing with how we communicate to people, how, how we keep a watch over our tongue. So be diligent to present yourself a workman who rightly divides the word of truth, who needeth not to be ashamed. Let me read it in the New King James. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we quote that scripture in a whole lot of ways. Mainly, we quote it to encourage ourselves to study the Bible, to study the word of God. But contextually, this well-known verse is set in a, a passage, a chapter of scripture that is teaching on learning to live in the body of Christ with difficult people. And what it's saying is this. If you're going to do that, you need the Bible. You need the word of God. Then we are told in the next verse, verse 16, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Shun profane words. These are words that Uh, have no spirituality in them. Profane words uh, are, are words that are characterized by leaving God out of your conversation. Idle babblings are empty words, words that, that possess no value. And we've all spoken words that have no value. We've all used profane words that have nothing to do with the cause of Christ. And the Bible says this will increase or lead to ungodliness, which is the purpose for this entire chapter. We need to learn how to deal with communicating in such a way that we aren't hurting the ears of people around us. We aren't keeping people from, from salvation. I mean, I have... I have talk to people who need the Lord desperately and they have their arms like this from the Lord because they had a bad experience with the Christian over things said or the way things are said. So important for us to take to heart this chapter on dealing with how we communicate and dealing with how we, we deal with people who communicate poorly to us. Verse 17 says, their message, the person who is talking like we just read, their message will spread like cancer. And it gives Hymenaeus and Philetus as, as an example. Now, here in verse 17, the words, 
It will spread like cancer. It actually is not referring to what you think it's referring to. When it speaks of can't spreading like cancer, it's not talking about a physical form of cancer, a malady. It's, it's not talking about that. It's actually talking about the canker worm, the canker worm, which is a locust. Let me, let me read you what a canker worm does because uh, Paul uses it here to describe someone whose mouth is out of control. The Lord says, I'll give you what you lost to the swarming locust. He's literally talking about a canker worm. Translated a cancer in the New Testament. To the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the cutting locusts. What is he talking about? Well, when he, when in verse 17, it, when he is talking about um, words spread like a cancer, he's talking about this canker worm, this locust. And here are, here's the characteristics of a locust. And they are the characteristics of someone who is using their mouth in a way that is unhealthy for the hearer. Who, who, is, who is spreading things, who is critical, who is voicing their displeasure on a continual, consistent basis. Here are the properties, here are the characteristics of that kind of person as seen in the cancer or canker worm. It says swarming locusts. You know what that means? It means that someone who is critical, someone who is mouthy, someone who is always speaking down and against, someone who hasn't learned how to communicate, you, you know what that person uh, is like? It, it's like someone who's gathering around themselves or who puts themselves close to someone who's just like them. You ever notice that birds of a feather flock together? People who who like to be critical, somehow, I don't know how it happens, but they find other critical people. And, and all of a sudden, they, they become a force. They become a power. <clears throat> people whose words spread like cancer, like a locust, find other people and they swarm together. That's what the Bible says. Also, they are like the hopping locust. They hop from ear to ear. The locust hops from ear blade to ear blade. <clears throat> Someone whose word spread like a cancer, like a, a, a canker worm, they hop from ear to ear, seeing whose ear they can get into. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It also speaks <clears throat> of the stripping locust. The stripping locust comes and when they're done with their tongue, there's nothing left, nothing left. And then the cutting locust. How many of you know words can cut? Words can hurt. So <clears throat> back to verse 17. <coughs> when it says their message <laughs> will spread like a cancer, it's describing what happens when that person is let loose. And then it gives some scriptural examples, Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, who is also known as Alexander. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 through 20 says this, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, which uh, they have suffered shipwreck. Verse 20, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Again, that's serious stuff. Hymenaeus was an opponent of the apostle Paul. He opposed him at every turn. It doesn't, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter what you say, 
Whoever is opposing you, they are going to say the opposite. It doesn't matter what, what, you, what comes out of your mouth, uh, they're, they're going to withstand you with, with their words. That, that's Hymenius. Philetus withstood the Apostle Paul's doctrine, uh, just constantly telling him his words were words of error, even though he was the one who was in error. And really what he was wanting to do was overthrow the Christian faith. So uh, that, those are the scriptural uh, examples. Now, let's go back to verse 18 in 2 Timothy. Uh, uh, in, in 2 Timothy. I don't want to get lost. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. Who have strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection is past, and they... Uh, overthrow the faith of some. We're still in the context talking about people uh, who are doing this. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. The solid foundation of God. If you're a believer, be a part of a solid foundation that stands. Don't destroy the foundation with your tongue. That's what it's saying. <clears throat> the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse 20. But in a great house, in a great house, listen, let me say this. A great house, a great church is not determined by the building. It's not determined. A great house is not determined by, by how much money they have or how many people they have or what their budget is, what their size. A great house is determined by its people. Not how many people, but what's in those people. It's, it's not determined by the pastor. It's determined by the people. A great house, you can recognize by what the people are doing with what they're receiving from the word of God. It's in the vessels which are people. So they're all, how many of you agree, there's all kinds of people in church, all types of people in church. Well, scripture tells us that there are. It says there, there are people of gold. There are people of silver. There are people of wood. And there are people of clay. Now, people of gold are, they're, they're the vessels that are the most valuable. Um, I wear a ring on my finger made of gold. I used this illustration last week, <clears throat> last service, and all of a sudden I realized that the younger generation, they wear rubber <laughs> rings. Anybody have a rubber ring on? You're in, yeah, of course, right, yeah. I need to get me one of those. <clears throat> but um, yeah, my sons, they, they have them. Uh, yeah, it's just you know, part of the, you know, what's happening now. So I guess I'm not part of what's happening now. But, but <clears throat> traditionally, what gold represents is is commitment, commitment, and really any ring, if you're married, represents commitment. And <clears throat> I, you know, Joyce and I, we're very human. We, um, it, it, for us, it's easy to live with each other. It's just us, and you know, there's not a whole lot to upset the apple cart so we have a very peaceful home and all that kind of thing and um, and we enjoy it. But um, <clears throat> if we ever, and we do from time to time because we're human, if we ever get in disagreement, I don't take my ring off and put it down there until she straightens up <laughs> or I straighten up. I don't. Because... This is commitment through good and bad, high and low. I mean, it's kind of like everybody was all up in a tizzy not too long ago, a few years ago, the uh, <clears throat> professional athletes, when the national anthem was being played, wouldn't stand or place their hand over their heart. They would kneel, um, <clears throat> a sign of for some disrespect, for others, just a sign of 
there's something wrong with America and so we're not going to honor it till it gets fixed. Well, that's like me taking my ring off because we've had an argument. It's ridiculous in my estimation. Um, so <clears throat> a vessel of gold shows commitment, it shows strength, it doesn't tarnish. A vessel of silver is not as strong, but it's still beautiful. It can tarnish, it takes some upkeep. How many of you have ever polished silver? It takes a little upkeep. It is strong, though not as strong as gold. Then you have the vessel of wood. Um, wood is breakable. Outside influences can destroy it. Um, <clears throat> we have a fence. My neighbor has a tree <clears throat> on his property, and the tree on his property came down and took out my fence. I mean, just destroyed it. And... <clears throat> um, that fence was useful. It kept what is mine on in and what was his, his side. His dog stays on his property. My dog stays on mine. His kids stay on his property. My grandkids stay on mine. So it's useful, but it's breakable. Outside influences can destroy it. Remember, we're talking about church people. We're talking about people. You a vessel of gold, silver, wood, or are you an earthen vessel? Are you an earthen vessel, a vessel of clay? That's the least developed. It's fragile. It'll, it's breakable. Now, who decides what vessel people are going to be in the church? I'll tell you who. It's the people. It's the vessels. I don't know about you, but I want to be the gold standard. <clears throat> and what this is teaching us today is to be the gold standard with the way that we talk. The way, the way that we deal with each other, the way that we deal with difficult, challenging people. Every person's a vessel. Every person has value. All four of the categories. And the person who you are challenged by may be an earthen vessel, but there's still value. And if you're trying to make it to the gold standard, you need to try to help them make it to the gold standard. And you... Got to go through wood first and then through silver and on into gold. But we need to see each other for the value and, and the honor that belongs to each of us. And, and here's the thing, by categorizing these four types of vessels or people, it shows a progression movement from one to the other. It's progressive. So let me just read through the end of the chapter, verse 26. Verse 21 says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. <clears throat> Flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, still talking about how we're dealing with people, we're dealing with each other, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. And in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Humility, humility says, I, I, can I help you because I've been helped? And if I can help you, then you can help me when I need help if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And then finally in verse 26, that they may come to their senses. We need to come to our senses, church, and escape the snare, the trap of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So we've got to grow in enduring people to bear up courageously against those who are challenging but need to be endured, avoiding the devil's trap, which leads me to the, the last thing I want to share with you today, and that's just simply to learn to endure trials and tribulations. If enduring, challenging people isn't enough, we've got to learn to endure trials and tribulations. How many of you have had a few of those in your life? Absolutely. Enduring trials and tribulations. Is there a difference between the two? There is. A trial is a test. A trial is a test. In school, you are taught you study, and then you're given a test to see 
what you've learned. In the kingdom of God, you are taught, you study to show yourself approved, and then you are tested to see what you know, to see what you've learned. James chapter 1, verse 12 says this, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial from God because having stood the test, having passed the test from God, that person will receive their A plus, the crown of life that the Lord, the teacher, is giving out. He's promised to those who love him. So that's the trial. It's a test to be learned and passed. Then there's tribulation. Tribulation is distress or suffering. It's a result of being oppressed. It's, it's persecution. Really, it's an attack. It's not from the Lord. Tribulation is from the enemy. Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22 says, and when they preached the gospel to that city, many made disciples, and made many disciples, they returned to Ly uh, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue, and let me know good things are happening, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We've done a great work for the Lord, and now we're gonna be persecuted now we're, we're going to catch it. We're going to have to suffer a bit, but it's one of the ways that we enter the kingdom of God. We, we've got many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Romans 5, verses 1 through 3 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse three, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation is gonna produce something good in us. Here, it's perseverance. Tribulation produces something good in us. See, what, what the enemy made for bad, God will turn to good. Now, Here's what the Bible says to do. Since both of these things are going to happen, you've got tests you're going to have to take. You come to church and learn, you're going to take a test. You serve the Lord, you're going to be oppressed. You're going to be attacked. Both of those things are going to happen in your life. They have happened and they're going to happen. But here's what the Bible says to do since both of these will happen throughout your life. The New Living Translation in James 1.12. New Living Translation says, patiently endure. The English Standard Version says, remain steadfast. New American Standard says, persevere. The CEV says, don't give up. The Good News Translation says, happily remain faithful. And I love the message translation. It says, listen to this. Now, we're talking about trials and tribulations. We're talking about challenging people. The message Bible says, anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and sticks it out is blessed. Anybody ever met a challenging personality and you just did this with them, but you stuck it out? You remain happily faithful, <laughs> persevered. You didn't give up. You were steadfast. You patiently bore up courageously. You endured. The Bible says you're blessed. Amen. You're blessed. I think James sums it up best in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, <clears throat> bondservant of God and of Lord Jesus Christ. And he said this in verse 2, brethren, Count it all joy. Now we're talking about the attitude going through trials, going through tribulations. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 
And then verse four says, um, that's what verse four says. Now, um, it, it says, knowing this, count it all joy, because verse three says, and here's why you can count it all joy. Here's why you can have a joyful attitude under trial, tribulation, is because you know something. You know something. What is it you know? Well, you know it's going to produce something good in your life, and you also know what the end is, and it's a good ending if God's involved in it. I, today is Sunday, and um, it's interesting to me that during football season, you know, everybody's wearing their jerseys at church. I love it. I absolutely love it. First service was crazy. And people wearing their football jerseys. Their team was playing today. And, you know, it's just nuts. It's, it's just crazy because um, what, it, it's just maddening. It's, 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 well, let me say it again. It's nuts. And the reason it's nuts and stupid is because you're watching a game you have no control over, and yet you allow the things that happen to send you spiraling into depression, <laughs> to cause you anxiety. You're on the edge of your seat, and, and you just don't know if you can handle this. You get angry. <laughs> Does anybody recognize somebody I'm talking about? Okay. <clears throat> I recognize myself. I'm a Charger fan. It's maddening. But what, what if, what if Jesus appeared to you before the game? And he said, don't tell anybody, but your team's going to win. Come from behind victory. Your team is going to win today, but you can't tell anybody. You, you, you go where all the fans are, you start watching the game, and your team getting ready to score a touchdown, they fumble. Everybody's so mad because they're one yard from a touchdown, and you're just sitting there smiling. <laughs> then there's an interception. Everybody says, I can't believe it. What's wrong with that quarterback? You're just smiling. You're at peace. Why? Because you know something. Your team is down in the third quarter, 27 to 14 in the third quarter, and people are besides themselves. You move into the fourth quarter, and, and people are just giving up. And you're just smiling. You're at peace. Why? Because you know something. And that's exactly what James is trying to tell us here. You should know that God works all things together for your good. You should know that God's promises are yes and amen. You should know that at the end of your trial and tribulation, you're going to grow and you're going to pass the test. And so because of what you know, you can count it all joy when we're down 32 to 14 with eight minutes to go because Jesus already told me we're going to win. And people look at you and they think, how in the world can you not be so messed up? Well, go back to verse 2. Here's why. Verse 2 says, my brethren, count. Everybody say count. Get all joy when you fall into various trials. The word count here means to calculate after the facts. When you're going through stuff, when you're challenged with that person, you need to calculate into your life the facts of what God has said about the end result. When you calculate in the fact that you're going to pass the test, no matter how bad this looks, when, when your calculation includes the fact that 
no matter what you are experiencing or what anyone else says, this is going to turn out really good, then, then you can count it all joy. You can calculate joy in. You can calculate patience in. You can calculate endurance, bearing up courageously. You put all the calculations in, and, and you know all things will work together for my good. You know, many atheists <clears throat> have something in common with each other. They all begin their life trusting in God, believing in God, early on at some point in their life. I mean, that just was built in us. Something is innate in all of us, opening ourselves up to God as, as a young child. And no matter what our parents believe or don't believe, but, but many atheists, because of a disappointment, uh, because they believe God didn't come through, uh, it caused them to abandon completely, entirely their belief in God, to reject him and to live a life of intellectualism minus a faith-based relationship with the Lord. And you, you might think, well, they had a diffi difficult moment, an event happened, something happened that, that, and that would never happen to me as a believer. I'd be disappointed, but I, I would never reject God. Well, you might think that's extreme, but how many Christians faced with unexplainable circumstances don't quit necessarily on God, but they quit church. They quit serving. They quit worshiping. Why? Because they're stuck. Something happened that has them stuck. Um, just recently, in the last couple of weeks, um, uh, someone who I really admired and respected, he... he uh, came and spoke here at our church, passed away. Cancer, uh, Mylon Lefevre. And his service was this past week, and I watched it. And, and I talked to him about six months ago. And, um, but it, it, really, it really made me heavy because he, he was a man of faith. He believed in God. He never doubted, not one time, that he would not be healed. He, he didn't. He, was, he, 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 he watched what he, how, what he thought about. He watched what he said and never ever considered the possibility that he would die of this cancer that had invaded his body. He, he, he was a man of faith, kept up his belief in the healing Jesus, right up until his very last words. His last words on this earth were to his wife, Christy. He said, Christy, I love you, and I'm healed. And then he was gone. Never, you know, and that, that just messes with me. It messes with my theology. Just, look, I know we're all going to die. We are. I understand that. And these bodies aren't meant to last forever. But in, in my estimation, you're just a little bit too young to go. And, and he was trusting God and believing the word. So it messed with me a bit. And, and as, as I watched that, I, I, I thought, to myself, you know, someday on those challenging circumstances like that, that all of us have in different areas, someday we'll know the whole story. Someday we'll know the backstory. Someday you might be privy to the secret things of God that we aren't privy to here today on the earth. And I think to myself, there are a lot of things that, in my mind, that just aren't right. And when I get to heaven, I think, I'm gonna go find God, and I'm gonna say to him, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> but the reality is, I won't do that. 
won't need to know when I get there. And, and so the whole story, the backstory, the, the secret things that belong to God's story, um, that's not my job as a believer on the earth. My job today has been laid out very plain in Scripture, and that is this. You patiently endure. Don't give up. Happily remain faithful. Count and calculate in joy, patience, and peace. One last scripture verse. Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk was a prophet of God, and his job was to call Judah back to the Lord. They were in sin and evil. Uh, the kingdom had been split, Israel and Judah, and, and, and Habakkuk, as a prophet of God, was, was calling to Judah to come back to the Lord. And here in verse uh, 17 and 18, he says these words that are so powerful, and I think all of us need to hear this. Though the fig tree does not bud... And there are no grapes on the vine. Ever had your life just feel like it's not very fruitful? And though the olive crops fail and your fields produce no food, you ever felt like a failure? And though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, your bank account is empty. Verse 18 says, Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. I'm quite sure Habakkuk didn't understand figless trees and crop failures and empty barns and stalls, yet he chose to rejoice in the Lord. I'm sure he didn't understand why Judah was the way Judah was, why uh, there was evil in a land and amongst the people that God had called to himself, yet he chose to rejoice in the Lord, endure in all things, to endure in all things, patiently endure, don't give up, happily remain faithful, count and calculate in joy, the equation of your life as you go through challenging people, tests, and tribulations. Let's stand together. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. The, the declaration of your word today is for us to keep a watch on how we deal with people that, that you have placed on the earth who are challenging for us. The word of the Lord is for us to not look at the emptiness, at the failure that is their life and ours, but rather to rejoice in you, to calculate in peace, to endure, to bear up courageously, to not give up, but to happily remain faithful. God, we choose to rejoice in the difficulty of times that we all face. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.